Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for making it uh, after lunch. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, thank you very much to the Impact Blockchain Conference. And I'm in particularly happy to lead a panel discussion today on the use of agriculture organization. Um, and I think I have some incredibly special guests here today for this uh, discussion. My name is Eduardo Perez. I'm from Impact Plus. We run Poly Social Impact Arm. And uh, the objective will be for the next 45 minutes to do a deep dive on the future of agriculture organization and to have a wonderful conversation with Jan, Yuri, and, and Mathieu. And I always think that the best way to start a conference, a panel, is of course to ask our panelists to present themselves uh, and to answer two specific questions, right? Since we're talking about blockchain and we're talking about agriculture, perhaps as they introduce themselves very, very briefly, they can tell us A, what got them into blockchain, and B, what got them into agriculture. Uh, Yuri, perhaps we could start with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting and organizing this. Uh, and I am Jorian Brewster, co-founder of Ethic Hub, which is a lending protocol for uh, smallholder farmers in developing economies, working in the intersection of crypto, impact, and focus on coffee for now, because I am a, a, a coffee producer myself. My family have a coffee farm in Mexico. And uh, what it got me to blockchain was in 2016, I, I wanted to start something. I did an innovation degree where I met blockchain, and I was in uh, this idea of starting something, and is like, uh, I am half Mexican, half Spanish. I can act as a bridge myself uh, between developing economies, developed ones. I know coffee is a uh, problem, no? It's more for the farmer's problem uh, that they like access to financing. Uh, and this is, uh, we, we are one of the very OGs, uh, together with Ether Risk for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, we started 2017, operational 2018, June 2018. And we have, you can, whatever people here, you can lend one euro to the farmers, try it over, you know, or provide collateral to those farmers by buying our token and staking on their behalf. Or you can even buy coffee. For now, this is more for uh, roasters, no? like big quantities, not for retail people buying a, a bag of coffee. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jan Stockhausen. Um, I'm the chief legal architect of Etherisk. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jan Stockhausen. I'm the chief legal architect of Etherisk. Etherisk has built um, um, a blockchain based insurance uh, platform, uh, mainly based on uh, um, Ethereum, but deployed on, on many of the copies like Polygon, for example, or Avalanche and uh, Binance. Um, Essentially, the platform serves to, um, to use smart contracts to automate insurance policies end-to-end, -end, uh, and we, in principle, um, can um, process a lot of different use or different, different types of insurance uh, on our platform, um, but we've, I think we're most visible at the moment in closer. the agricultural insurance uh, closer, space. Closer. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Um, what got me into agriculture is probably uh, my family background. Uh, um, my family is, uh, uh, f has an agricultural background, uh, mainly livestock farming. Um, and uh, yeah, a blockchain, how did I get into blockchain? I think it was uh, um, in 2016 or so that I started getting fascinated um, when I was still sort of uh, uh, actually in a, in a finance job uh, and uh, somehow this, this drew me in and actually the the team of Etherisk and what they were doing. I knew them at the time and uh, they became friends. And when I sort of left my last job, uh, they kind of pulled me in and, and here I am uh, sort of uh, trying to um, help smallholder farmers access agricultural insurance by making it sm uh, faster, cheaper and more transparent. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, my name is uh, Mathieu Le Sueur. I'm a researcher in uh, CNRS, uh, and uh, as my uh, neighbors, uh, my my background is uh, agriculture, and um, oh, you know, uh, I'm not fluent in English, so uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
so I, I, I have started uh, by uh, as an engineer in uh, agriculture, in uh, agro industry. I have worked uh, for many many years uh, in agro industries, uh, um, 50, 15 years to be uh, precisely. And uh, now, uh, recently, I have done a PhD, a PhD in uh, economic sciences and uh, management sciences on uh, blockchain applied to uh, supply chain. It's okay for a presentation. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are connected to agriculture in any way, working-wise, beyond eating? How, so we have, okay. So, so we have four or five people, right? So I guess the first question for you guys is, we have a group of people who are not very uh, knowledgeable, I would say, or particularly knowledgeable in agriculture, or more than, than other potential fields of uh, blockchain we could uh, work. Why do, you think, why do you think blockchain can play a particularly important role in the field of agriculture to the point that you're dedicating your, your life to it? I'll let any of the three take the question. Perhaps I'll take a stab at it even. So. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, blockchain it reduces the barrier of entry for a financial system. One of the things it does, no, it's not the only value it has, it provides. And uh, that allows us to think on um, inclusion. Who are the unbank? Are smallholder farmers in developing economies. So now we have this technology, we should use it to solve the biggest issue with the traditional financial system that is that it left excluded the, a quarter of world population and most of them are smallholder farmers in developing economies. And uh, so one is uh, for sure a reduced barrier of entry, but this is not yet there because the user experience is so complex and many of those farmers still don't have even mobile phones. Uh, so it also provides other kind of values. For example, traceability for sure. Uh, you can uh, embed uh, crypto incentives in the economic relations as we are doing in Ethic Hub with this crowd collateral system, which at the end has a, 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 an incentive loop behind it. No? The, the more lending, if they are trustworthy and they don't default, the more demand for ethics. And, the, and so on, more secure is the compensation system and more people willing to lend because it is more secure and again and again. And I think that's the, the most important part of, of, of blockchain. No? It's not the, 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 the base layer, uh, is, is what you can build, the, the incentives you can build within new economic systems in order to uh, get new things, no? for example, financial inclusion. Yeah, I think for, for us the answer is similar. It also revolves around closer, closer. Around, for us the answer is similar. It also revolves around financial inclusion. Um, agriculture. We we are obviously in the agriculture insurance space. So um, I think what's important to know is that uh, um, smallholder farmers in developing nations are extremely. Um, exposed to climate risks, uh, increasingly so, of course, with the pro uh, sort of with uh, increasing um, effects of climate change, um, and they absolutely need insurance. Uh, yet, only about three percent of smallholder farmers have insurance, um, and that needs to be changed, um, not only to secure their livelihoods, but also um, um, because smallholder farmers produce uh, around thirty percent of globally consumed calories. So. Um, if they lose a season, they will drop out of the agriculture game. Um, they will become migrants. They um, sort of uh, will normally sort of sell their farming tools or their land. Um, often, um, they pull their children out of school. All kinds of negative effects happen when they um, lose a season, and it can be only one season. So they absolutely need to be insured, um, also for the sake of, of global food security, because they contribute with a significant part to the global calories that we all consume every every year. Um, so um, uh, the problem is, why do they have so, why is the uptake so little? Why do farmers uh, only, why are only 3% of the farmers insured? And the, the answer is really um, insurance payouts are too slow. Um, insurance is too intransparent for farmers. They don't really understand it and it's too costly. And blockchain can solve all these problems. And we've 
for example, in our first sort of use case at scale, we were building on a, on a first pilot in, in, in Sri Lanka, but the first use case at scale with 30,000 30, farmers in 2021 um, showed that we could reduce the uh, operational costs by 80%. Um, we were, um, the turnaround times for claims payouts was the African average is, I think, 120 days. We turned that round to less than a week, and 40% of the payments were paid within uh, 24 hours, and that was possible because of the single source of truth that all the actors that are involved in the, in the delivery of the insurance product could use and, and could rely on, because it's an, on an immutable ledger. Um, and sort of, uh, so the, also sort of the fact that, um, obviously, the data um, that went into the insurance uh, policy processing is sitting on a public blockchain, obviously makes things, it couldn't be more transparent. Uh, and uh, farmers were able to sort of um, uh, request the policy up, uh, status update at any given time by the SMS, and that really increased the transparency. So we, we're, we, we're able to solve a lot of those problems um, that hamper access of smallholder farms to insurance with, with blockchain technology. And, and that's just the start of the story. Thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to, I am agree, I am totally agree, and I wanted to add something, is that uh, when, you, when we are thinking about uh, supply chain, uh, we usually don't think to something that uh, uh, the supply chain is not only a logis uh, logistical chain, it is also a value chain. So, uh, and a big part of this value is brought about by uh, the proof uh, linked to the data. And when you bring proof to the value of the products of the farmers, the farmers are in a, in a central position of their own economic systems. They can, um, they can, uh, they, they, if they, are so, if they are in a central position, it eliminates uh, intermediaries that are not useful, right? And uh, everyone else, for example, uh, can verify the proof of their transaction and efficient blockchain would decentralize the verification of the proof, which is precisely what happened in the case of uh, Twiga Food? If you read the little book of um, uh, Jacques André, Twiga Food is an example in Africa where uh, farmers are in uh, control their own ecosystem. And is it possible because they are uh, producing their own proof of their productions? And they, they don't need intermediaries, which is costly for them, right? So, as you said, uh, effectively we have traceability, we have cross data, we have, we have insurance, transparency. But it's not only a matter of that. It's a, I think it's a new economic way if we use an efficient blockchain and not a, 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 a private model which is uh, very uh, uh, too closely, uh, too, too restrictive. So you, you got me thinking, Mathieu. Um, one of the big, big questions I've always had when I think about a value chain is how do you actually ensure that the data is not tampered with, right? The coffee is put in a truck, truck starts going to the warehouse, we put the truck aside, another comes in, off we go. This is a classic question that many people who are not in this space have. How do you answer that question to someone who wouldn't know about blockchain and you want to convince him to enter into this world? Bridging that analog digital space to the point they say, you convince me, I really think my organization should move to blockchain instead of other traditional systems because in this case, they will not be tampering. And I truly believe that what will be on the blockchain will be the reality and will, there will not have been human intervention and, and scams behind it. Um, the thing is that uh, in blockchain, the consensus mechanism is uh, the consensus is obtained by uh, all together. We are all together uh, in uh, uh, agree. Uh, we are all together agree, and uh, if we are not, it doesn't work. So uh, that's uh, the mechanism 
ou euh, qu'un euh, 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 encourage uh, trust between uh, uh, each other. I I think one thing is trustability itself, no? That is okay. We tamper-proof this. You can do that some way with. A, more centralized databases, etc. No? Uh, for me, the real use case is to provide a skin in the game to the actors that tamper-proof that mm. data. It, it is, okay, you, you are saying this farmer is agroforestry, you put some skin in the game, and if somebody proves you are not, not doing your job properly, uh, you lose your skin in the game. Uh, so it's a lot of theory of games, uh, what it is allowing mm. uh, this technology. Uh, for me, what's, that's the mind-blowing part of it. Because the other, I mean, the traceability, just traceability is cool, for sure, we have to improve traceability, but we can use a centralized database mm. with, with uh, sort of mo um, uh, uh, so modification records no? uh, on it. No? Uh, and and I think, as you said, uh, it's uh, the disintermediation. Now, a, a lot of the supply chain was think for pre-internet era, and now we can jump many intermediaries, especially if we find because most of them were mostly financial thing, um, and and if we can provide money all the all the way down the supply chain at the end you you just need very few people in between to to, to do the logistics and and secure the quality in, in that supply chain not as, as we have now with coffee it's like crazy it's like nine people in between of you and and the farmer you know <laughs> and you can do with three as we are doing in the hub no? it's it's hard to think that for Industrials, uh, for manufacturers, it's hard to think that they will share data each other. It's not a natural way to do. And uh, uh, thinking that enterprise will share data in a trustworthy world, it's it's wrong. Uh, they only share data when they are sure that uh, it is impossible to cheat. This point is crucial. And there are also uh, there are also points that to be careful with. Uh, first, the system does not engage people in building strong ties with each other. Uh, the information system built must be interoperable with the information system already in place. We we have uh, before blockchain, we 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 made traceability. Uh, the problem is not to make a traceability. The problem is to 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 have a proof associated with this traceability. And we have to build system that uh, it should be possible to get rid of it without too much difficulty, and uh, and not to be locked in. So the information system has to be interoperable with the systems already in place. And manufacturers are afraid of how their data will be used. And in particular, of the vertical integration of data. I can't explain it uh, very uh, precisely, precisely uh, what is it, but uh, you have to think that uh, someone can control your production by using your data. And as I said before, uh, your data is your value. So it's a crucial point. So uh, the blockchain, more of that, that is built must therefore ensure that participants have equal rights and, and use, to use the data and avoid the risk of, of vertical integration by another okay. people. So let's, let's stay a bit with the concept of, of participants for a minute, right? Yes. Um, on, on paper, we all drank the Kool-Aid, yes? Uh, the, the, the applications of blockchain and agriculture are extraordinary. And then we talk to the people really doing it in the field or the, and we realize we have a big scaling problem. We're still having difficulties to reach all those different users. Mm. Um, perhaps, um, Jan, could you tell us a little bit more about why, if if it's such an amazing product uh, in this case, in general, right? Blockchain is is uh, so useful for agriculture. In your case, specifically for insurance, 
and the benefits have so clearly been stated. I mean, if, you're, if you can reduce your, your claim from 120 days to a week, on paper, the, that, it just seems obvious that people will do whatever it takes to, to do that. So what is creating that hold up when the advantages that you are explaining are so high? And then I'll pass it on to you, Eddie, because you, you have similar issues with uh, circumstances. And you, barely, you basically t you touched it a little bit before, but I'd like to, um, Jan to go there first, please. Yeah, for, uh, in, in the insurance world, it's, or uh, agriculture insurance for smallholder farmers, it's, I, I said we, we, we reduced the costs, um, the operational costs uh, for the insurance product by 80%, which does sound great, and it is a great accomplishment, but... Sorry, how did you measure that 80%? percent by basically simply um, sort of the back office uh, was eliminated by, because all the work that's normally done by sort of claims verifiers or, or sort of uh, people who sort of check sp spreadsheets against each other and send emails back and forth between the insurer and the reinsurer and the, uh, and the sort of the actuaries. Um, so all that sort of back office work and, and sort of the manual labor, let's say, uh, of, of, the, of the teams had, had been eliminated and was, was done by smart contract. So, so that's how we got to a, um, a pretty good result. Sorry, that's how we got to a pretty good result. Um, unfortunately, those 80%, um, if you put this in context, um, the um, operational costs um, are only, they only um, represent about 20% of the overall um, premium of the insurance product. So if you reduce this by 80%, 80 you still haven't really changed the game in terms of uh, really offering a price that is dramatically cheaper so that the farmer can actually afford it. And, and it's actually sort of this what is, what is at the moment sort of what we're working on with, with a lot of uh, um, enthusiasm. We realized um, a few things. Obviously, the farmers normally have the same size field year on year, but climate change is progressing and, and the risks or the climate risks that the farmers are exposed to um, is, uh, increases every year. So obviously, you don't have to be an insurance expert to understand that um, the price for the risk, or the net price for the risk, let alone the, um, the operation cost, the net price will have to go up, not down. So if the farmer has the same size field every year, how is he ever going to afford insurance? And that's sort of when, when we started thinking about um, insurance revenue models a little bit differently. It was actually started by a conversation that we had um, about a project that we are uh, working on with UNDP in Ghana, um, where UNDP was looking for an insurance element to um, encourage farmers to um, engage in uh, sort of climate smart farming practices. So the, the idea there is that the farmers are um, uh, trained to, to do um, something that's called AWD irrigation, which is sort of essentially um, alternate wetting and drying. So you don't flood the field for weeks on end, but just at very specific times that reduces the methane emissions of your rice field, and, and that uh, will translate into carbon uh, emission, uh, sorry, sorry, that will translate into uh, carbon credits that you can verify and certify and then sell, um, in this case, to the Swiss government. So that's when the penny dropped, and I thought, okay, uh, obviously, the, the, sorry, the, um, I should have mentioned, um, the, the revenues then are shared, of course, with all the farm, farmers participating, and that's when the penny dropped for me, I thought, okay, if the farmers, or if 97% of farmers cannot afford insurance, maybe it's not because insurance is too expensive, maybe it's because the income of the farmers is too low, and I mean, that's where we have to, where we have to make a difference. So we're trying at the moment to come up with and we're very much actively looking for, for all kinds of partnerships in this space. We're trying to connect the farmers to the, farmers, to the carbon markets to help them unlock an additional source of revenue mm -hmm. um, through sort of the sale of carbon credits that they can generate with pretty simple car carbon farming strategies like mm -hmm. the use of agroforestry strategies or biochar. Um, so that, that will increase their revenue and then you could basically just throw in the insurance which is then not really a significant cost anymore, and you could just throw this in. And that would, I think, make a real difference in terms of uptake and, and, and massive distribution. So, Yuri, before I pass it on to you regarding this uh, aspect of, um, of the challenges for adoption, right? Would, would you agree with what, what Jan just said regarding, because you were, you're operating in a completely different environment, you're in Mexico, that the biggest problem for farmers is that they can't pay for insurance. Are you f 
seeing similar things and how do you approach that in that different context? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree that uh, at the end a more holistic approach is required. That's why we are helping them selling their crops, they are providing the money, So because then you have a, a more revenue streams for the loan originator for the or cooperative at the end no, of the farmers. Uh, in order to be sustainable, the work they do with the farmers, and they have to have a very holistic business model. Uh, um, which has to include the, the insurance, it has to include the lender, the lending, it has to include selling supplies to the farmers, uh, it has to include uh, selling the product afterwards, and for sure, uh, carbon credits is a, 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 an, a, another ingredient in order to have a, a better unit economics to work them in a sustainable way. Uh, we are also working in this regard. No? Uh, we are more like, uh, as there are no solutions for, at least for the farmers we work with, which is small coffee producers in Mexico, Brazil, in Latin America, in six countries in Latin America. Um, the problem is, in order to do this certification of carbon, it's, it's almost impossible because, because it is three hours drive, two hours walk, uh, so the economical value of going there to to me just measure the plot, because at least in Mexico I have a paper that says this farmer have two hectares of land, but in many countries you don't even have that. Uh, but not even in Mexico, you have the polygon of land that you can at least take uh, imaginary satellite uh, data on it. So. Uh, in the previous panel, they were talking, oh, it's very important the data for the carbon credits, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, I fully agree, but uh, the problem is then the smallholder farmers are also excluded from carbon credits as they are excluded from financing and from everything. Um, yeah, but uh, so for us, for sure, that's important, uh, but uh, it's many things. I, I, I think user experience is one of the key points, no? the, especially for our, I mean, we don't, we don't even try to, to give the farmers a wallet yet because uh, it's, it's just to, uh, the, the friction would be amazing. No? If it is hard with the investors, it's ten times harder with the farmers. You have to think. Some of our farmers don't even know how to write or, or read. No? So, in many, I mean, from the 1.2 smallholder farmers worldwide, almost one billion, 1,000 far, million farmers still don't have electricity. So, it's very challenging reach them, no? That's why it's so important, this holistic approach. Um, and I think uh, it is also required more support, no, for institutions. We, we are uh, now getting there, no, finally after some five years, no, uh, to, to get more support from institutions to, to, to do our job, which is super challenging. Well, let's stay on support, right? And one of the key support from institutions is regulation. Mm -hmm. What's that looking like in the agricultural space? <laughs> for, for insurance, it's... Um, uh, and then we'll ask the same question for, for, for value chain. Yeah, for, for insurance, it's um, uh, obviously regulation is, um, uh, let's say, a stumbling block because it forces us to... Um, to do, um, obviously insurance is a highly regulated business and it's, there's normally national regulation on insurance. Um, so if you're gonna offer an insurance product, especially if it's to vulnerable um, populations in the low income sector, um, the regulators are going to watch over this. And um, of course you don't want to sort of overstep the lines with regulators. So it forces you to a country by country approach. Um, and I think this is, this is one of the reasons why um, um, why its um, sort of distribution is also so slow, and why why no um, insurance killer app um, just goes viral? Because it's you have to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations in every new market that you're approaching, or you have to have local partners. But then they're also regulated entities. They're normally huge organizations, very slow moving. They like innovation, so they say, but then when it comes to implementing innovative um, solutions, especially with something that's really cutting edge like blockchain and, and sort of uh, 
uh, uh, token models, it's, it's, it gets very complicated. So I think that's, that's where sort of regulation um, hampers things. But there's also, um, I would say, a, a light at the end of the tunnel because there, um, uh, there are certain sort of um, avenues to try and, and go around that. Um, for example, we, we're working on this very actively and it's of, of course sort of my domain, domain as, as, as the lawyer in, in Etherisk. Um, on, we're working on regulatory models that avoid our products being actual insurance mm -hmm. uh, solutions. So for example, in, in Germany, we sort of after a little bit of back and forth with the regulator, we were able to um, get a letter of no objection f from the German regulator to distribute our flight delay uh, insurance, well, mm -hmm. protection product, product because it, mm -hmm. for, from the regulator's point of view, it wasn't actual insurance because there were certain sort of legal uh, elements of an insurance contract missing. So we were able to distribute this outside the regulatory uh, space. So that's that's very interesting, and that's where we're going. For example, I know also our partners in in Burkina Faso World Food Program. They have a whole team okay. working on forecast-based financing solutions. Um, sort of uh, disaster risk financing solutions, which works like an insurance product, but forecast-based financing works not with actual data of what happened, but what's forecasted, so that's not insurance. Right, right. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of interesting models, so I think over, eventually we'll overcome this, and, and blockchain will, will play a huge part there. So insurance changes a lot within countries, does it change a lot also, uh, sorry, um, um, regulation changes a lot within countries, does it change also a lot towards uh, value chain? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, governments uh, uh, has a big impact, in fact, on uh, on on uh, on the laws uh, that are promoted, and uh, um, obviously on, on the on the laws of uh, farming, on the farming with the. Uh, so, uh, blockchain is a way of uh, controlling the the application of the laws. But uh, of the regulations, uh, but uh, actually, uh, French government. I, uh, I can speak only of the French government because we, it is the only one that I know uh, doesn't use the blockchain. Uh, and sad story, but <laughs> it's like that. So one of one of the challenges we always face um, whenever we try to build something is, of course, funding, right? Mm -hmm. Um, up to now, uh, when we had a bull market, of course, the funding came a lot from L1s, L2s, etc. And this, uh, I've, got, well, I've got a number of questions related to that, but as we face a bear market, and w how do you think the industry is going to evolve to become sustainable? How are your solutions going to become sustainable to the point that we can move away from a grant model? And I'm not only speaking of grants from um, L1s, L2s, I'm also talking about the traditional USAID grants so that startups can become self-sustainable, go to VCs, and really start growing without the this, this support and that constant um, pr uh, problem. How are you guys solving this? You're, I think you have an we, announcement, actually, on, uh, regarding uh, this, right? <laughs> we didn't get a grant ever. So <laughs> the point is uh, you have to create a sustainable business model, and so on. You get funded by people, I mean, but uh, for-profit investors or people no, who, who believe in, in the opportunity we have to create a mutual beneficiary business models based on this technology because it, 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 that's a key part of, of crypto from my point of view, you know, that it allows for these, these new business models to arise and 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 it, it is embedded the financing for for the projects that succeed for sure. Um, well, I, I think I think you're spot on there, Ed, um, with uh, saying that um, in the um, blockchain uh, or Web3 space, a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of uh, sort of protocols work on a they they work towards a platform model. So. Um, obviously, that's that's a, a very long shot, and if you're successful as a platform, it's it's a huge success. But um, you need um, a fairly long runway to get there, and um, uh, I believe a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, um, companies in the space have relied on um, their tokens to sort of extend the runway, and that worked 
in a bull market or in, in a reasonable market that works. Uh, when the markets uh, dry up, then uh, that becomes very difficult. You're right, and then sort of um, we were lucky enough to be able to rely on some grant funding. Um, but for us, the sort of we, we were sort of also having exactly that conversation internally, and and um, sort of especially for us at Etherisk Impact in the sort of division that deals with sort of climate risks and, and sustainable development um, efforts, uh, especially revolving around far smallholder farmers, the question was if the smallholder farmers have very little disposable income and they're expected to pay for insurance premiums that are going to make our business model eventually sustainable, how is this going to work? I already pointed out that they're already struggling to afford insurance. So this is exactly when we started looking at the carbon markets, which are set for um, staggering growth. I mean, this, I think McKinsey's uh, study pro uh, predicts uh, um, uh, a 25-fold um, increase of the market size from now to 2030, which is from 2 billion to 50 billion. So um, obviously, there's, there aren't enough carbon uh, credits in the market to satisfy that increasing demand, so the price will go up. So the, we kind of sort of, came because of this project I mentioned with UNDP, we kind of started thinking about like, so why should the farmer not access this? And why shouldn't we somehow make it possible like, for example, UNDP makes it possible to, for the farmers to access revenue from those markets. Um, ACORN is another example, the Rabobank's ACORN project, um, who we know well, and, um, uh, and, and they're also doing something similar. And it's, it is possible, and I think um, it is, at least for, for, for us, sort of in the segment of, of, um, uh, of, sort of uh, um, financial inclusion of smallholder farmers or low-income populations in, in, in developing nations, I think this is definitely something not to be ignored, yet, that there is a lot of capital flowing into those markets and a lot of demand of larger companies that are setting net zero um, targets. I think the, the number of companies is tripling every year. So there's huge demand, and why should the farmer not participate in this market? Why can't we democratize it? So, so we're, we're on this mission at the moment to try and sort of, sort of couple or, or bundle insurance with programs which are sort of including the farmers into those, in, into those farm, carbon farming activities. Yes. Um, my my uh, research works are going to to say you that um, private blockchain model adopted by manufacturers uh, is not effective. And not least due to the vertical integration of data that implies uh, the strong connection that it established between uh, participants and the lack of interoperability of the, of the solutions. And uh, the questions uh, that we, we can ask ourselves is, what uh, what is a blockchain? Uh, what is what could be an efficient model of blockchain uh, for uh, for supply chain and for uh, agricultural supply chain? And the, in my opinion, uh, the most efficient model of blockchain for supply chain management is a hybrid blockchain because it is interoperable and allows all participants to verify the proof uh, linked to the transactions. And so um, uh, the first uh, model uh, adopted by the manufacturers, the private blockchain, is a, is a good first start, but is not uh, sufficient. So I think we're slowly coming to the end of the first 45 minutes of this session. So perhaps I'd like to close it with, uh, with a, a general comment from you guys. I'll start with Mathieu as, as the researcher. Uh, where do you see the trends going in this space in the next five to 10 years? The trends? Yeah, the general trends. Where, yes. where, where are we going? Um, where are we going to? So, <laughs> I've read something on this, <laughs> and uh, two things are es essential for me. Um, the first one is, uh, as I said before, the interoperability of, uh, of the systems. Blockchain with uh, ERP, uh, blockchain, public blockchain with private blockchain, and so on. This is the first one. And, and uh, the second one is uh, decentralization. Decentralization of what? It's not 
decentralization of uh, of uh, decision making it's it's complicated but first we have to decentralize the verifiability uh, verifiably no i don't know verifiability, verifiability <laughs> of the proof <laughs> and that's it and I know a startup, and it's not to make uh, publicity. Uh, it's just to say, uh, if you can, if if you can take a look at it, it's called uh, KeyX. And for me, KeyX uh, still have uh, five five years ahead. So, all right. Well. I think um, I think there's there's, um, um, there's there's I think one comment I have about um, um, the blockchain sort of space in general and and what you what you were mentioning about the sort of the the, the difficult market situation. Uh, I believe um, um, a, a, someone once said uh, a nasty person, of course, said once a blockchain was a, a solution that's still looking for a problem and. Of course, that's not true, but I think to a certain extent, it is true that um, um, b blockchain has still not sort of broken through um, as the um, sort of the, 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 the common standard of technology in any industry space yet. It's not in agriculture, not in, um, not in, uh, in supply chain. Uh, it, is, it, is, um, it is still sort of in early stages, and it's it's uh, it needs to break through in in some space, and then I think it will be like the traditional internet. Once it broke through in, for example, uh, online sales of books, then all of a sudden all the other industries ca caught on. Um, I believe this is this is going to come soon, and I'm, if I had to make a bet, for me for blockchain technology, this will be the carbon markets. Because there, there's a lot of things that are broken in the carbon markets and need to be fixed, and blockchain can fix them. And if you look around, there's Vera doing public public consultations about blockchain. Gold standard is um, Climate Action Data Trust, um, uh, the, backed by World Bank, is uh, is working already on blockchain with Aita. Um, so there's a, a huge interest in that industry sector. Um, about solutions that blockchain can deliver. And I think if I had to make a bet, that's where blockchain technology is going to break through and that's going to be the first industry sector where it's going to get to sort of massive, um, massive adoption and, and then other industry sectors will follow. Um, yeah. It's quite a topic and I, I just had a question for all of you raising hand. How many of you actually think that the carbon credit market will create that tremendous change that we're, we're talking about here? I'm just curious, how many would you completely raise your hand saying, I believe in carbon credit markets? I'm just super curious here. We could really raise your hand so we can see them properly. So we have around 30%, 40% of the room, right? Yes, it's a very divided topic, so very interesting. I wish, we, I wish we had more time to dive a bit deeper here, but we'll have to close it with, uh, um, yeah. with Yuri, unfortunately. So, uh, for sure, carbon credits can be one of the one of the key points for making adoption and impact into agro agriculture. Within blockchain, for me, finance is the use case that it has already uh, a use case, no, a operational use case. The DeFi is huge already, and it is starting to go to the real world. No, uh, Centrifuge and Goldfinch uh, have over 300 million under management, uh, supporting real world economy um, and growing exponentially. I think, especially in the next bull run, and uh, and I think uh, also governance in the future is like the end goal, no? The the opportunity for decentralized organizations, DAOs, as we are gonna, going to, uh, we call them. Uh, that's huge, but this is the most difficult thing to change the the, the governance of things. Uh, but it, I, I mean, for me, that's the highest potential of blockchain is to provide us with a tool to uh, take human collaboration further. No? And and within agriculture, uh, spe specifically, uh, I think. This regenerative uh, co uh, agriculture is the is the big thing 
that can be supported with with a blockchain. No? Uh, uh, this is steward. Uh, uh, we have to support the stewards to take care of the land that uh, are planting trees and and doing all the job we need to survive as human species. And I think that's where uh, one of my guesses is now that AI is taking over millions, billions of jobs, we should rethink humanity and, and, and give the incentives for many people to go back to the countryside, not to plant, uh, to, to have cows, for sure, because it's very unsustainable to continue eating cows. Uh, but now that we have alternative proteins, uh, sources, uh, that a lot of uh, uh, land that was for, for cattle, will be available uh, back for planting trees uh, and, and carbon credits will be supporting, uh, one of the keys for supporting these stewards that go back to, to the lands to, to make agroforestry in tropic agriculture, which is not only about uh, producing single crop thing in an intensive way, but doing a uh, very holistic uh, food production that is also good for the environment, biodiversity, and water, etc. Good, thank you. Uh, Mathieu, Jan, Yuri, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And I think we're ready for the second part of the session. We will be interacting a bit more th uh, with my... Uh, sorry, well, well, I forgot. Uh, we didn't talk to that point that is tokenization at the end. Uh, and I think tokenization will be super powerful tool, not only of carbon, uh, also, um, the 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 coffee, the, the, the I mean, the products themselves will be tokenized, and 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 when linked to the global commodity markets, which has, has huge liquidity, and that will be a change maker for 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 the crypto world, because you can leverage on that liquidity, uh, and this is something we are working on too. All right, thank you, nerds.